So my name is Matt Moore. I'm the co-convener of the Information Innovation at UTS seminar series. You probably met my colleague Hilary Yervery in the red jacket downstairs on the way in. Um, so I'd like to begin with a, 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 an acknowledgement of country. So I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus stands. We would also like to pay respect to elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Right, so who here has been to the seminar series before? Hands in the air, please. Right, so probably over half, right? So in a nutshell, the point of this seminar series is to bring together practitioners and academics in the information management space. And the idea is that we want to try and keep practitioners rigorous and academics relevant. <coughs> All right? So uh, we're associated with the Digital Information Management Master's course. Are there any teachers on that course here tonight? Raise your hands in the air. Yes, there's a few of them over there. Uh, if you're interested in the course and uh, the kinds <coughs> of topics that, we, that we're going to be discussing, please, please talk to them. Okay, so tonight the format will be three short talks and then a Q&A session. Okay, so I would like, you will all have questions, each and every one of you, I can feel that right now. Okay, I'd like you to hold those questions until our three presenters have spoken and then you can go nuts. Alright, so we are very fortunate this evening. We have three fantastic speakers, right, from academia and industry. Right, and we also have probably the hottest topic in our domain at the moment. Right, as I was saying to somebody over there, who here has heard of Marie Kondo? Right, this is about as hot as Marie Kondo is right now. <laughs> right, so machine learning. All right, so the commercial use of artificial intelligence techniques such as machine learning has exploded in the last few years, and it's kind of moved from being pipe dreams to being real. Right? And what we want to talk about tonight is not the theory behind it, although we will be touching on that, but how we make this real and how we use it. So we want to talk about how these tools work, how you apply them to real world problems, and what the challenges, risks, and opportunities are. Right? So our first speaker is Professor Paul Kennedy, who is Director of the Biomedical Data Science Laboratory in UTS, and he's part of the Centre for Artificial Intelligence. Um, he's been a general chair of the um, Australian Data Mining Conference since 2007. He's been the co-editor of the AusDM Proceedings since 2006. He is an ARC expert assessor. He's co-authored over 100 publications. And he has just flown in from Myanmar this morning. Okay? So he's kind of committed to this. So he might so, fall asleep. <laughs> I'm sure that won't happen, Paul. So... Over to Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, what I was going to do was just uh, really give a demystifying machine learning talk. So there's no maths at all, so don't worry about that. We're just going to just give an overview of what machine learning is. So I want to talk about just what, what, what machine learning is. We'll look at uh, several different types of machine learning and what machine learning can do and what it can't do. We'll look at uh, some examples of machine learning, some everyday examples. Uh, I'll give a few brief overviews of um, just some of the really common machine learning techniques that people use today. And then um, a little bit about how people go about solving problems using machine learning and how it can go wrong in different kinds of ways. So first off, what machine learning is about. So there's a really nice example or description of machine learning by a guy called Tom Mitchell. This is in a book by, called Machine Learning from 1997. So this field's been around for quite a long time. So Tom, was, uh, Tom Mitchell was saying, computer program is said to learn from some experience uh, using some tasks and a performance measure. So as an example, um, the, tasks mi the task might be, can we predict whether a customer will take up an advertising offer or not? And the way we're going to measure how good the algorithm is, 
is by using some kind of performance measure. So we could say the percentage that are correctly predicted out of some known examples. And the experience that we're going to give the machine learning algorithm is a whole lot of examples, past examples, of, case of customers who did take up the offer and who didn't take up the offer. So we just show all of these examples to the algorithm and it will get better and better at them and the way we're going to measure that it's getting better is by using this performance measure. There's another example or another sort of uh, framework for how machine learning can work uh, in a nice book on machine learning uh, by Flash. He's talking about uh, we have some domain objects so that's just a machine learning kind of term for saying customers, things in the real wor world. And we have some features or things we know about those customers. So it could be things like their, um, w what they've bought before, where they live, how old they are, all those kinds of things. And the task is to build some model that can produce some output using those features. Again, it could be, will they, will they respond to an advertising offer or not? This, the one that I always use in class is, will, uh, will they pass the, the um, subject or not? So the machine learning problem that we're going to bolt onto this is in the blue. So the learning problem is we need to have some kind of training data and we use the training data to train this learning algorithm to solve that problem. It will build some model and then we can use it with the, with, with the, in the real world with the features that we do. So this is all a bit um, vague. Let's talk a little bit more in detail. So. There's a, there's a large number of different kinds of machine learning algorithms. So let's talk about what they are, or at least the major ones, what they can do, what they can't do. So machine learning breaks down into two main kinds. There's unsupervised methods and there's supervised methods. The unsupervised methods are all about just trying to make sense of the data. So here's my data set. Let's go back to the customers again. Here's my customer database. Can I group my customers into groups that are similar to one another? So I'm just trying to understand what the customers are about. I'm not trying to predict anything, just trying to understand them. So we're trying to make sense of the data. You could think of it as visualization in, in a way, because visualization is a little bit like this kind of thing. The, uh, the other main type of machine learning is supervised methods. Supervised methods is the prediction problem. So we're going to learn a relationship between some inputs so things we know about the customers and an output that we want to predict whether they take up the offer or not and using some old data. And the idea is once we understand that mapping, then we can use it with data where we don't know the answer. We have new customers, we can ask the machine learning algorithm, will they accept the offer or not and we can say yes or no. And we can measure how well it is using that performance measure that we talked about in the first slide. Uh, there's a, and I'll, I'm going to go through these in a bit more detail. There's other kinds of machine learning methods. I'm not going to talk about them just to let you know that they're around. There's a thing called re reinforcement learning. Has anyone heard of AlphaGo? Yeah, so AlphaGo is a good example of this. It's uh, an agent that's living in some environment. It's getting some feedback from the environment. It's trying to change the way that it acts so that it wins in the environment. Uh, the semi-supervised learning, which is a bit in between those unsupervised and supervised. The transfer learning, which is quite popular these days. You learn in one space, apply in another domain. Uh, and one class learning, which is sort of like classification, but um, it can be used for fraud detection and problems like that. So supervised lear unsupervised learning is this first one. We're just trying to make sense of the data. So that blue blob there, blue square, imagine that's an Excel spreadsheet. So we've got rows in our Excel spreadsheet. They might be, let's go to the example, we have customers. And then the columns are things we know about the customers. And when we apply our supervi unsupervised machine learning method, maybe clustering is an example, we can group our, our data into these groups here. So here we've got um, our customers grouped into four groups where each group is similar to one another but different from the others. Not trying to predict anything, just trying to make sense of the data. Supervised machine learning, here we're trying to do the prediction. So we've got our, here's our Excel spreadsheet again, but now we've got another column. And this is the column that we're trying to predict, the class or the target attribute. And this is the thing that we're, so here's all of our customers, the information we have about them, the previous customers. Here's um, whether they took the offer or not. 
And once we've learned that mapping, then for new data, where we don't know the answer, we just ask the machine learning model and bingo, it says what the answer is. And we can see how accurate or, or not accurate that method is based on measures that we've made previously. Uh, so people will often talk about classification or regression. These are examples of um, supervised machine learning methods. So what, what can machine learning do? Well, in the unsupervised space, where we're just trying to make sense of the data, uh, it can divide up the data into data points, or the data points into groupings. Um, hopefully they match reality. Usually we try to um, group them so that the groups are similar to one another but different to others, and generally that does match reality. And we can assess how well those, how, how grouped those clusters are. In the supervised case, uh, if there's enough data points, so we need enough data, uh, with few enough attributes, we don't, want we don't want too much attributes. And if that data matches what you're trying to do in the real world, so if it's a good representation of your problem, and there's a mapping between the inputs and outputs, there's, there is some relationship there, and there usually is, then these methods can find that pattern and they can find a pattern that will generally generalize to data it hasn't seen before, and we can estimate how well it does that job. So what, what can't machine learning do? First off, it's not magic. It's just um, algorithms. Second of all, it's very heavily reliant on the data that you have and the quality of the data. If you don't have very much data, it's n or, it, or that data doesn't match the problem that you're trying to look at, or it's really messy and, and missing or dirty or, or has problems, it won't be able to solve the problem, or it won't be able to solve it as well. Um, it doesn't, these methods, uh, they don't understand how the data is related in the way that a human does. And I'll show you a good example of that in a moment. And depending on the method, they can't necessarily tell you why they've made a decision. So if we've made a prediction, it can't necessarily tell you why that prediction happened. So just a couple of examples now. Um, this is a first good one. Um, so when we buy a book on Amazon, it will tell us you might, be, you might want to buy this book. You can see that as a machine learning problem. It's, it's trying to make a prediction. Uh, there was a very nice example back in 2012. Uh, so Nate Silver correctly predicted the outcome of the US election in all 50 states. Uh, and this was, this was excellent. In 2016, his methods didn't work at all. Uh, and maybe this is a good example of um, the quality of data. But it was good in 2012. Um, this is a really nice example. So back in 2012, um, there was a method called AlexNet. So this is a method using um, something called deep convolutional neural networks. Um, we'll talk about neural networks in a minute. Just think of it as a complicated mathematical equation and a fairly deep one in terms of layers of, of information. And this method famously won this, this big data mining competition called ImageNet in 2012, and it won it by a huge margin. So it got 15% error, error, and the next one got 26% error, so 10% better. The problem is, um, given a picture, tell us what category it is. So um, this is a picture of a mushroom, so agaric and mushroom came up. Uh, the top one is a container ship, and it comes up. So this, uh, this was a problem that people can do really easily, or generally pretty easily, but computers couldn't. And this pretty much single-handedly started this, this deep learning um, craze. Uh, in 2015, it was built, it was bit beaten by um, a method called ResNet, developed by Microsoft. Um, so back in Myanmar, where I've been for the last week, um, and there's a thing called Google Translate. I don't know if you've used Google Translate. It's like magic. That's using, that's essentially using deep learning neural networks as well. Uh, so these methods are really, you can't query the, the method very easily and say, why did you tell me this is a Madagascar cat or whatever. So there's a nice method back in 2016 called LIME, locally interpretable model agnostic explanations, that tries to explain these methods. Okay, 
Um, this is a picture of a frog. This method can tell you what bits of the picture um, relate to that, to tell it it's a frog. So here it's highlighting, this is a frog. It's telling it why it thinks it's a frog. The second most, um, the second explanation was billiard balls. This is telling you why it thinks the picture is a picture of billiard balls. An example where it doesn't work very well is here. Here they've trained a, a model to um, classify a husky as a wolf. And then they said, why did you say, why did you say this is a wolf? And it said, this is why it's a wolf. <laughs> Nothing to do with the dog, but it knows from all of it, the data that it's seen, that wolves live in the snow. So if you've got snow, it's a wolf. That's what I mean, it doesn't understand what wolves are. It's just using the data it gets. Another example, um, there's a thing called an adversarial patch. If you put this patch in a picture, it can completely screw up the classification. Top is a classification, it says it's a banana. This says it classifies it as a toaster. Uh, so let me just go through really quickly the kinds of methods. Um, in the unsupervised cases, there's two, two main kinds you'll see. There's things called market basket analysis. These look at big data sets of transactions. They're going to say things like, if people buy bread, they'll buy butter. And there's ways of measuring the quality of the rules. The clustering we've already talked about, so I might flip that one. In terms of classification and regression, some of the methods that you might come across, decision trees. Uh, this is a decision tree saying whether it's going to rain tomorrow in Canberra. So it's saying, you read it from the top, if the pressure at 3 p.m. is greater than 1,000 millibars, and the cloud at 3 p.m. is less than 7.5, then no, it won't rain. So you follow the path through. It's nice, you can easily explain what's happening. There's a method called random forest where you put a whole lot of decision trees together. So here we have a data set, we build a whole lot of decision trees, slightly different ones, and then they get to vote on the answer that they think is right, and then the majority vote is the one that gets the, the answer. Uh, there's neural networks. Usually they're a lot more complicated than this. The idea is the inputs get put into the left-hand side, they filter through, and they make a prediction at the outside. Uh, I might skip the support vector machines. So how people go about solving these kinds of problems, um, the most important thing is to work out what your business question is. You need to think, what am I trying to get this thing to do? Am I trying to understand the data? Am I trying to make a prediction? If so, what is it? Once you get that business question right, you, the, you can then translate it into a machine learning question. Then you go about collecting your data, cleaning it, building your models, evaluating it, and then deploy it. It's never like this. It's always an iterative problem where you're going through and asking more and more, uh, learning more about the data. There's a, there's a methodology that a lot of people use um, called CRISP-DM that you can look up. It just takes you through each of these different phases in solving these problems and says what you should do in each of the phases. Uh, there's competing ones. Um, there's one from SAS called SEMA. Uh, last couple of slides. So one of the most important things is we need to validate the methods. Generally, um, there's several approaches to this, particularly the predictive ones that I was talking about. But often what you'll do is you'll split your data up. So if this is your entire data set, you typically use most of it to train the, the model. You use part of it to validate the, to, ch to set the parameters and tune them. But you keep this last bit, it's called a holdout set, you keep that separate, and then you use that to valid, as, a, as an example of how the model would do in the real world. This is a typical approach. There's other approaches, bootstrap validation, k-fold cross-validation, but the typical idea is you keep a holdout set. Uh, and then my last slide, but maybe the most important, how can this go wrong? First off, you could ask the wrong question. Ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. Uh, you may not deploy it properly. Um, there's a potential for the model to go stale. So um, if you're in a pro if you're in a if you're trying to model something that's changing over time, if you're trying to predict the stock market, the world changes and the model that you built yesterday may not work tomorrow if an earthquake happens or, I don't know, a president dies. Uh, you can have overfitting. That just means that your model does really well on your training set, but when you evaluate it on the test set, it does very poorly. Underfitting is sort of the opposite. 
you, you just have a low training accuracy. Uh, if you have too many attributes, too many um, columns in your data, then that's much harder to solve the problem. That's called the curse of, well, it relates to something called the curse of dimensionality. Every time you add a new attribute, you need exponentially more data points to understand it. Typically, you use things like feature selection to reduce it. You can have imbalanced classes, more of one class than the other. So the typical example is predicting cancer. You, your data set generally has, not, has a few examples of people with cancer, but many examples of not cancer. So you build, it's easy to build models that predict not cancer, but you want to predict cancer. It's type 1, type 2 errors in statistics. Uh, and your data set could be biased, um, or you could do insufficient data cleaning. So they're the, the main kinds of ways it can go wrong. How am I going for time? Bang on, good. And Q&A is afterwards. Thank you, Paul.